Hi everybody, this is Professor Guffey and this is the video to go along with chapter 12 where we are starting to move into talking about organized labor and the regulations that govern that. Now, this is a chapter that deals with a good bit of history, so that's where we're going to start. Keep in mind here from its origins as illegal criminal activity, collective bargaining has evolved into a legitimate way for employees to earn equal bargaining power with their employers. The National Labor Relations Act, the NLRA, you'll be hearing a lot about that, prohibits both the employer and the union from discriminating against employees based on union membership. And it also sets forth prohibitions, which are referred to as unfair labor practices, which again can get, be committed by either the employer or the union, and they're wrong on either side. And additionally, this act creates the National Labor Relations Board, the NLRB, which is the administrative body that's charged with the responsibility of enforcing all the provisions of this law. So as we go through this chapter, one of the things I have to admit that irritates me about this set of slides, they do something that I always object when students do it, which is they have just crammed so much per slide. So we're going to um, skim a little bit of this, okay? But you do need a little bit of background here on labor development in America. Now, keep in mind, with the founding of this country, there has always been some tension between employers and employees. The idea was that craftsmen back in the very late 18th century, in the very beginning of the 19th century, saw the importance of organized activity to resist employer attempts to reduce wages. Originally, these were viewed with a lot of hostility from the courts who viewed them as criminal conspiracies. Not all labor activities were held to be illegal, but an awful lot were. And as long as the objectives of the activities and the means were not illegal, the labor activities were viewed to be okay. But the laws were really stacked against employees coming together to, uh, to honestly to lobby for better working conditions and better wages. There was something called a yellow dog contract, which is an employment contract requiring employees to agree that they would not join a union. And those were really common at, at the very beginning of labor development in this country. Post-Civil War, you start to see a real uh, push for organization to happen among uh, workers. And I mean, you even see it in the names like the Knights of Labor, the Noble Order of the Knights of Labor, which came out of Philadelphia right after the Civil War in 1869, sought to organize both skilled and unskilled workers. There's a real push with socialism in here too. Keep in mind, Karl Marx, who we associate with socialism, and Russia um, actually was in London for most of the time he was writing his major works like, uh, like Das Kapital. He was in London. He's buried in London as far as that goes. And when he worked to establish the International Working Man's Association in London in 1864, that really got interest in socialism going in the U.S., Initially, it sought to organize unions. It became political after the railway strike in, in uh, the 1870s. The big organization to this day in this country is the AFL-CIO, which began as two separate organizations. The AFL, the American Federation of Labor, focused on wages and very practical, very immediate goals. The Congress of Industrial Organizations, CIO, was a federation of unions that really focused on unskilled production workers. Those were workers that were being ignored, mostly, by the AFL. Finally, the two organizations came together and they were the dominant body in uh, the American labor movement, the AFL-CIO. Um, 
in 2005, seven major unions that accounted for nearly 6 million workers broke away from the AFL-CIO to form its own organization, the Change to Win Coalition. Now, recent trends, and by recent, we really mean looking after World War II, so looking in the 1940s. These were boom years for the labor movement. America had, honestly, the only um, workforce that had not been completely destroyed by World War II. The European countries, England, France, obviously Germany, Italy, Spain, were just, were, were in tatters following World War II. We really were uh, kind of, to use the old phrase, in the catbird seat. We were uh, really working from a position of power. We had the manpower, we had the factories, we had the raw materials. Unions really grew in strength here until about one third of the American labor force was unionized. Uh, union membership peaked in the early 1950s. It's been declining ever since then. The late 70s and 80s were marked by the quote, restructuring of American industry and honestly restructuring, think uh, the beginning of moving things offshore. As of 2009, and I get that that's more than 10 years ago, less than 8% of the United States private sector workers were union members. Um, there has always been a push me, pull me between the two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats when it comes to this. Uh, and you see that in the last bullet point here. The election of Barack Obama and the control of both houses of Congress by the Democrats brought a renewed hope to the U.S. labor movement. Well, the global meltdown in 2008-2009, followed by, obviously, COVID. Um, the U.S. labor market is in a bad place right now. That usually goes along with a call for unionization. And we will talk about some of that and some of those trends that are going on now. But um, organization has always been difficult. Now, there have always been some legal responses here, too. The, actual, the idea of actual judicial hostility has decreased over time. But there are some new legal weapons here, including injunctions. Remember that injunctions are court orders to provide remedies that prohibit some kind of action or command or commanding that some wrong be righted. And you use injunctions when just money isn't enough to repair the, um, the wrong. Often injunctions have been granted in what are referred to as ex parte proceedings. Ex parte proceedings are not favored because only one party is there to uh, to have their side of the story be heard. We don't like that in our system. We really want both sides to have a chance to be heard. Yellow dog contracts, which have already been mentioned. Keep in mind, those are employment contracts that require employees to agree that they will not uh, join a union. And by making an anti-union promise part of an employment contract, employers could then legally make non-membership in unions a condition of employment. The idea has always been, well, if they wanted to join a union, they didn't have to sign this contract. The fact is, yes, they did, because if you don't sign the contract, you don't get the job. So that the yellow dog thing has often been um, a real area of tension. There have been laws dating all the way back to the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 that outlawed certain restraints on trade and certain illegal monopolies. That's one way that there have been some, some pushback on employers having too much power, but um, we can argue whether or not it's been particularly useful, especially when you look at at how social media, how those companies have really uh, dominated the, the market. You get to the Danbury Hatters case. That's a fun one. And the issue here, Danbury, Connecticut, believe it or not, a town that you've probably never heard of, 
for a long time was home of the haberdashery industry, hat making. And the 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 folks who worked at the at the this hat making company wanted to unionize. The company responded by filing a suit under the Sherman Act, the Antitrust Act, alleging that the boycott, because the workers were saying, you know, boycott this company's products. So the company responded by saying, okay, this boycott is a conspiracy to restrain, uh, restrain trade. Um, this, it works its way all the way up to the, the Supreme Court. Who, who holds that the boycott is a combination of restraint of trade within the meaning of the Sherman Act. Um, that, that will change. Boycotts are honestly as American as apple pie. You then get into the duplex printing company, printing press company v. Deering case that also deals with labor union activities and how they fit under the Sherman Act. That gets us to the development of the National Labor Relations Act, the Norris LaGuardia Act. And really what it was here was a legislative response to judicial actions. Under common law, the law develops through court decisions instead of through statutes. Well, we do things a little differently here. So the provisions here that are important are sections one, three, and four, and one, says, okay, federal courts, you just can't do injunctions in labor disputes that go beyond the very strict interpretation of the language of the act itself. Three, section three says yellow dog contracts are contrary to public policy. They're not enforceable by a federal court. Section four says there are these listed activities that are protected from injunctions, okay? And um, the, a, a number of states passed their own legislation here that did the same thing, that, that were known as little Norris LaGuardia Acts. Because, you know, we, we, don't, we don't like activist judges. We don't like activist judiciaries. Making law is the uh, job of the legislative branch. So that's how we get the National Labor Relations Act. Um, you get into the Pult Holmes case, which dealt with uh, injunctions and whether or not how they were to fit under under the, the act. Um, it continues to develop here. You get the Railway Labor Act. You get this set procedure for how disputes are going to be settled. This has been amended a number of times by Congress in 34, 36, 51, 66, and it's extended to cover airline employees. The idea here is that there is a duty to bargain with the representative of the other side, and it was specifically spelled out here. Uh, National Industry Recovery Act sets up how major industries are going to operate to have fair competition. The National Labor Board gets set up in, in August of 33. Remember, this is as we're in the throes of the Great Depression. In order for, for our system to work, labor and management have to be able to talk to each other. And they have to bargain in good faith, which has not always happened on both sides. It's a real issue. Roosevelt got rid of the National Labor Board and what they did was, what he did was transfer. And he transferred it to the, the National Labor Relations Board, the quote, old NRLB. Um, we're, we're seeing a move here that's really important. So the National Labor Relations Act passed by Congress and acted into law back in 1935. Again, look at the timing of this. Basically, Section 1, the very first part of this says, if employers deny the right of employees to organize and refuse to accept the procedure of collective bargaining and it leads to strikes, which have the intent or the, quote, necessary effect of burdening or obstructing commerce. This is a problem. 
So workers are now legally protected in their rights to organize for mutual aid and security. Think of that as a quote. And to bargain collectively through representatives that they choose. It can't be that the other side chooses who they're going to bargain with. Section 7 allows collective bargaining through representatives of the employee's own choosing. And you, this is also where we get the concept of the, quote, closed shop. A closed shop is an employer who agrees that he will only hire employees who are already union members. It is a closed shop. If you're not a member of the union, you can't work there. You get a basic organizational chart here. I'm just going to hush for a minute so that you get a look at this. It talks a bit here in the chapter about how the National Labor Relations Board is organized. Keep in mind the board is the judicial branch of the agency. The five members are nominated by the U.S. President. They have to be confirmed by the Senate. They serve five-year terms. The general counsel is the branch that prosecutes. Um, this is done by administrative law judges, ALJs. These judges are independent of the board and the general counsel. It, it just does not work if you do not have independent judges. So we definitely do that. Um, this is just a sample form for, for a charge. This is a charge of unfair labor practices. Here's what you need to know. The National Labor Relations Board handles two kinds of legal questions. They handle unfair labor practice charges, and they handle elections, okay, representation. Employees choosing whether or not to be represented by a union as their exclusive bargaining agent. These are the things that the NLRB handles. The process, and again, this is where I get irritated with the slides. They're too small to be useful to you. You need to print these out so that you can really see them. The jurisdiction is of the NLRB is to deal with labor disputes occurring in commerce or affecting commerce. And we're going to step through these. General jurisdictional standards, exempted employers, exempted employees, and jurisdiction over labor organizations. So the jurisdictional standards are set in terms of the dollar volume, okay? And for instance, general non-retail firms, retail businesses, combined manufacturing and retail enterprises, national defenses in here, public utilities, uh, hotels, motels, residential apartment houses, multi-state establishments, all of this is, is within the NRLB's jurisdictional standards. Not all of them are subject to the provisions of the National Labor Relations Act. Certain employers have been excluded. Federal government, any state or a political subdivision of a state, like a county or a city. Uh, labor organizations in their representational capacity. Those are exempted. Exempted employees, take a look at these. They include individuals who are employed as agricultural laborers. That is a really hot button issue right now. Individuals who are employed as domestics within your home, or they're employed by a parent or a spouse or independent contractors. Some of these exemptions really are hot button issues, especially agricultural laborers, um, for reasons that we can get into. But think of it this way, if, if we actually paid a prevailing wage to people who picked crops, the cost of food would skyrocket. An argument can be made that the problem is that we don't pay a realistic price for agricultural products, especially produce. But um, the other argument, of course, is that this keeps prices down. The question is, does it keep them down artificially? There are also some other exemptions created by the U.S. Supreme Court, including supervisors. That's really the big one. Persons with the authority to direct, hire, fire, or discipline employees in the interest of the employer. 
are uh, considered exempt employees here. We start getting into some cases here. I'm not going to just go through the cases because honestly the slides do a good job of it and we don't want these videos to become just dreadfully, dreadfully long. So I'm going to suggest that you print these out, that you stop and, and highlight and take some notes as you read. I am more interested in getting over to um, our ethical dilemma here. So, graduate assistants are part of the judicial exemptions, okay? So, and that ties in here with our um, ethical dilemma, where you're a vice president for faculty relations. There's no formal collective agreement between the administration of the university and this organization called the American Association of University Professors. Because of declining enrollment at your university, you have in, and the fact that you have increased building maintenance costs and you have expenses in updating computer facilities, the university is really having some financial difficulties. Read COVID. The administration decides to freeze faculty salaries and reduce its contribution to faculty medical insurance and pensions plan. Should the university administration continue to work with the organization, the American Association of University Professors, in its capacity as the faculty representative, or should the administration impose its financial proposals over the objections of the organization? Which approach would you recommend and why? It's a really interesting real world problem here and one that is well worth some, some thought. Um, whether or not someone qualifies as a confidential employee was brought up in the mean and oil case. Again, I'll let you take a look at that. And the definition of employee comes up again in the town and country electric case. So again, let you take a look at that. This really dealt with the phrase dealing with, okay? That is pretty much the end of it. It ends with this city of Seattle incident. But again, this chapter is really just kind of giving you the framework to get into these other chapters that are going to deal with the nuts and bolts of how uh, collective bar bargaining works, how unions come into being, those sorts of, of, of issues. This gives you a good place to start though, and thank you very much, chapter 12.